Thank you so much for coming. My name is Ruth McCambridge, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Nonprofit Quarterly. I'm glad to welcome such a large crowd today to um, the first of um, a series of four webinars that we're doing on executive transition and succession planning. Um, this is the first ever collaborative between uh, the Nonprofit Quarterly, RAFA, uh, PC, um, and board source. And the reason why we decided to do this particular topic together is because we all have a body of work on the topic. And we also, all three of us, had noticed that some things have changed um, in terms of executive transitions. And we wanted a chance to just um, start up a dialogue about what the best practices or the, or, or the good practices are around executive, uh, executive transitions and and succession planning. It does, uh, the issue does have, oh, let me be, before I go on, let me just say thank you to Cornerstone On Demand, which is sponsoring this session and has allowed us to present it for free today. Um, Cornerstone On Demand is a leading cloud-based talent management application that helps nonprofits recruit, develop, and engage employees and volunteers to help the, the organization accomplish its mission more effectively. I also want to say very quickly that um, for all of you who um, are listening in, you can be more active participants by writing in questions at any point during the webinar. Just, you know, log your questions in on the question and answer area on the right-hand side of your screen. And that will allow us to choose some of them for the end of the webinar when we'll spend about 15, 20 minutes taking your questions. I wanted to talk just really quickly about what it was that we were noticing um, that, that kind of ur urged us to go ahead and start this series. Um, there have been two recent research reports, um, one of them coming from Board Source and one of them coming from the Council on Foundations. It had some kind of marked findings in them. Board Source uh, just produced their annual uh, survey, the findings of their annual survey called uh, Leading by Intent this year. And one of the things they, uh, they found three things uh, relative to executive directors. One, um, one finding was that 94% uh, of executive directors are over 40. Um, second is 41% of executive directors have been in their positions for 10 years or longer, which is just an amazing tenure. 80% um, have been in their position for three years or longer. This was notable to me as I looked at it, but it was when I actually looked um, later at a Council of Foundations survey that it really struck me that what we're looking at is a very long tenure of leader um, that's relatively older. What the Council on Foundations study showed, it was their salary study, is that 61% of the CEOs and philanthropic organizations are 50 to 64 years old, um, and 40% of those have been in their positions um, for 10 years or more. And so that is a remarkable similarity between the two studies, that what we know is approximately 40%, if you put these two things together and use it as a proxy, approximately 40% of executive directors in the nonprofit sector have been in their positions for 10 years or more. Um, um, so the assumption would be that these executives probably have a good deal of um, native knowledge about the way the organization works, that the moment of transition for them is going to be a fairly profound moment for the organization. But it's, we're not just talking about the, the transitions of, um, of older executive directors and founders, but the, um, we're also talking about the um, younger directors who are, who are cir circulating through leadership positions at this point. We were just talking right before this webinar about the fact that, you know, for a lot of younger leaders, there may be, um, it, it may be a little bit shorter tenures at first and then longer as they, as they move along. 
We're going to um, welcome in a minute um, Rebecca Wagner, who um, you may be able to see on your screen now, but she is the um, the executive director of Advocates for Children and Youth, um, and she has been in that position since 2011. Um, but she has been in a number of executive director positions. She's going to talk to us a little bit about what the experience of entering and leaving. This is kind of in the category of good beginnings and endings. Um, what that what that um, experience was. But um, we also have, uh, as our major presenter today, Tom Adams. And Tom is, um, he is the head of the Executive Transitions Group at RAFA PC. And as such, he's been um, following this field and really leading in this field for the past more than 20 years, Tom? Uh, yep. yep. <laughs> Um, and so he has a lot of experience with uh, the issues in different sizes of organizations and organizations with a lot of different variable factors, how secure their funding bases are, um, how, how, you know, um, well-schooled their boards are, um, what kinds of relationships they have with the rest of the community. Those kinds of um, issues are really uh, serious variables in any kind of um, succession or, or um, transition. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today, and he's going to walk us through um, some of the language that we're going to be using throughout these four webinars, and then and also some of the definitions um, of different kinds of, of situations that you may be looking at. Um, the reason why we started today with this particular webinar is because um, we feel like this, this moment of transition when an executive director leaves an organization is a moment for that organization to take true stock of of all of the variables that may have to do with their sustainability. And that would include, you know, their enterprise plan, the security of their revenue, um, the kind of, of, uh, of capacity that it, it needs um, over the near future. And so um, the, the, the issue of transition is very tightly connected to the issue of sustainability in organizations. There is a lot to be lost by doing a transition badly. Um, all kinds of things, including you know, revenue, uh, uh, reputation, revenue, all kinds of things can be lost during that period. And so, what we want to do is to try to talk to you about those things. What is it that the board and the staff need to look at? Um, in, in future um, webinars, we're going to talk, be talking more specifically about the role of the board and the, and the executive director. But I think what I'll do now, Tom, is hand this over to you so that you can talk a little bit about the definitions, our little glossary of uh, terms that we'll be using. Great. Thank you, Ruth. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, when Ruth told me how many people she expected today, I thought we were going to be talking about the weather in New England or some other topic that uh, had broad national appeal. Uh, it's exciting to me that we can come together around this topic, uh, and it really is a topic of both executive and organizational transition. They go together. You can't de-link them. Uh, and part of what we want to encourage today is a broader look at executive transition not being solely about the executive and to give executives and boards language so that they can comfortably prepare for executive transition long before it happens. So we're going to talk about two time horizons. One is those of you who may be looking at executive transition within the next year or less and who need some immediate uh, what's my next action. And then we're going to be talking about those of you for whom executive transition is on the longer horizon, uh, who maybe don't have a particular date in mind, maybe two, three, four, five years out. And we're going to talk about some practices. And we call this the end game and a framework because we really, there's a mindset change, a, 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 a change of the way we do business that we, we began addressing executive transition 20-some years ago because of all the pain that was in the sector. 
uh, national foundations, national nonprofits all wanted to reduce the pain. And so we developed some systems and practices that we'll talk about that do that, reduce the pain of, of transition, and more importantly, leverage what the potential is. Because the, as, as Ruth said, each of you has co-created something that's really important in your own communities and organizations. You have built something that uh, your community counts on. And if I were to, we would go around and ask all the folks on the call, if you've ever seen an executive transition go poorly, uh, you would all nod your heads and say yes. And so the question today is, what can we do to not lose ground as an organization or as a sector when we go through executive transition? And more importantly, what can we do to gain ground? And so we want to talk about three ideas that are interrelated and three practices that allow you to be preparing for transition all the time and to manage it better when it occurs. And these practices apply to all sides, types of nonprofits, and I'll try to be clear about the differentials as we go through about what, how it applies to different sizes. So let's take a look at the first idea, which is succession planning. So succession planning, you, you may have heard of it in the corporate world, uh, and if you have private sector board members, an important thing about succession planning is to make sure we're all using the word the same way. Because for some people, the succession planning is when you fill the vacancy. For some people, it's about bench strength. For some, it's about having people ready to go. There are a variety of, of, of definitions. The one we use that applies to the, to the nonprofit sector is it's a process of ensuring continuity of effective leadership. It's really about leadership continuity. And we do that by attending to a couple things planned and unplanned leader transitions, and advancing a leader development culture. So there are really three uh, approaches to succession planning. One focuses on the basics, kind of the, the block and tackling, if you would, the, the fundamentals of succession planning. That's having a written succession policy and a written emergency backup plan for both the executive and managers. These are available in template form, and we can talk later about how to take that work a little deeper into bench strength, but that's a fundamental. If When boards don't think about succession in advance and try to deal with it when it occurs, it's much harder to think about how are we going to handle internal candidates and, and some of the who's going to be on the transition committee and some of the important decisions. So those are all handled in writing the succession policy. We then want to build a leader development culture and so we look at bench strength. And finally, we look at how to plan for planned departures. When executive transition occurs, there's a private period of planning where the executive's mulling that over, thinking about it, maybe talking to close confidants, depending on trust relationships with the board, maybe talking to one or two board members. And then that begins to become public. And the decision to depart moves through to the successful onboarding of the successor, which includes that person getting through a 90 and six month review and getting their first budget and first experience in the organization. Typically in the process of, of leading and facilitating executive transition, there are three phases. The first is preparing for both the transition and the search. There's more going on than just the search. And boards that just focus on the search miss the potential and the power of the transition and are often uh, caught off guard by transition issues they're not attending to. The second phase is the search itself, which needs to be proactive and really aimed at the kind of folks that you want to get in your pool. And the third and often under attended is the onboarding of the new executive. It's important to really remember that executive transition is both about the executive and about the organization and to focus on both. Next slide. The, when we we do all this in the context of organizational sustainability. There's a book that Ruth and Nonprofit Quarterly just did a webinar on a few weeks ago called The Sustainability Mindset. And that really is the mindset we bring to executive transition and to success, succession planning. That This is a field driven by passion, by people who care and are committed. That's why private sector people want to join us, is because they want purposeful work. And so we have purposeful work because we're doing important work. And so focusing on how do we sustain that important work and how do we make the most impact around our mission. So it's about the intersection of exceptional impact around mission and our financial viability because we don't pay attention to the 
finances, then we can't get to the mission impact. Sustainability planning is an organizational self-study process which supports that long-term organizational health and mission impact over a, a, a longer term, over a perceivable future. When, next slide, I want to just talk a little bit about how we get the sustainability. You know, it's hard to be sustainable if you're not stable. And so we need to look at our basics, make sure that our infrastructure is really in place, that we have a way to manage our finances and know what, what income and expenses we have, that we have a way to have the IT platform that we need to do business, that we have the staff that we need, that we have a governance model and a, a board in place, that we have a sense of strategic direction. If we have our basics, then we have some stability. Once we have stability, we can then think about longer term impact and how do we sustain that over time. We've developed a framework at RAFA that builds on the work of a compass point in the sustainability mindset that pays attention to three dimension, four dimensions of sustainability. The first is strategy and business model. Has the world changed and do we need to be thinking about our mission in a different way uh, given what today and tomorrow brings? The second is leadership. What do we, leadership do we need today and in the future, both on the board and on the staff and in the executive team? The third is resources broadly defined. Obviously, that's operating income, it's capital. It's also the reputation of the organization and the infrastructure that makes that happen. And undergirding all that is the culture. You know, there's this overused statement that culture trumps strategy every day, and it's true. If we don't attend to culture, then it's hard to get sustainable. The end game, though, is vitality. It's really what I like to call a humming organization. I'm sure many of you have had the opportunity to be in an organization when everybody's pulling in the same direction, where it's really a joy to go in in the morning and do the work. You're making great impact in the community and your, your area of work. It's hard to stay in humming. Things change, and so we're moving back and forth between sustainable and, and vitality all the time. I just ask you to think about that, these, this framework, executive transition in the context of succession planning and sustainability planning, and attending to all three of those reduce the risk of tr executive transition becoming a challenge for the organization. I'm going to turn it back to Ruth to give us a little uh, real-life context. Well, I think it's Becky who's going to give us some real life context, and um, because Becky has um, has actually entered and left um, leadership positions a couple of times, she's going to talk about what that experience has been and what she thinks that other people need to pay attention to. Thank you, Becky. Happy to be here. So I can never begin this conversation without the famous Washington Irving quote. There is a certain relief in change, even though it be from bad to worse, as I has often found in traveling in a stagecoach, that it is a comfort to switch one's position and be bruised in a new place. I think about transitions and I think about the bruises that happen both personally and professionally and organizationally. I followed a founder of 27 years. He was a bigger than life beloved man and he had done heavy lifting in the community, work that any of us would have been proud of. Uh, so I um, approached it with great caution. The board, fortunately, had done some good work. They had taken some steps to move the board to a more professional level, understanding what the governance role was, and um, quite honestly, being more than people who got together to have coffee and cake with the leader. Uh, they were people there for uh, advancing the mission of the organization. Uh, my greatest um, learning from that experience was that I, I tweaked things for the first year, but I did not go in and slash and burn and move furniture and change staff. I just tweaked things. And the gift that this uh, beloved leader gave me was that he went away. He introduced me to 50 of his key stakeholders. He handed me off in position, and he went to London. I mean, literally went away and made himself unavailable. Um, and I believed that if he was graceful enough 
to, to not be a backstop for everybody who was either unhappy or disappointed that I was the new leader, that in turn, I could yield some grace to them. And um, I, what that means, I didn't have to tell everyone that I inherited 12 months of unreconciled bank accounts. There was, nothing would have been gained by that. He spoke to me quietly and he said, this organization, this organization is way beyond what I can do. It was my awesome idea. I've had some Pyrrhic victories and I am going to ride into the sunset and leave you this to do something with. <laughs> well, uh, the, the, the exciting thing for me during that lift, and it, it was a lift, we, we went from uh, an $800,000 budget to a $5 million budget, from 10 staff to 117 staff. It was, it was a big 11 years that we worked together, uh, but he had laid the foundation. The challenge we had was to move people from being in love with him to being in love with the mission of the organization, and that was probably the hardest work to do. Um, the board helped me in that, given they acknowledged I wasn't going to uh, slash and burn the founding director, they never said to me, well, he always did it like this. If I brought him a new idea or an important issue, but of course, you know, as executives in your own right, what you have to do with your board is find your friends, find people who will say no to you, find people who will think with you. You really don't have to do anything. You have to trust that they care as much about this organization as you do. So I considered the boards not, not insisting on staying where they were, but moving forward with me was literally like watering a plant. They were giving our organization the chance to thrive. Um, so uh, 11 awesome years and I initiated a transition period. Um, we had lots of appropriate things in place. I'm a little bit of a management nerd. We had a succession plan for emergencies. We had a planned succession. So I met with the board and the executive, I met with the executive committee and the board chair to talk about what challenges would occur during this transition. Uh, then uh, we took this challenge and plan to the whole board and they uh, excused me for about two hours and they talked about not what was best for me, which was perfect. They talked about what was best for the organization because I had worked too hard to see this organization um, piddle away because, because our transition plan wasn't successful. So we literally put a one-year transition plan in place and each month at a board meeting, we would report on the status of each one of those steps so that the time that I left, we had an interim who stepped in for seven months, which allowed time for, I mean, we even had the RFP for the transition um, management group to come in. So it all worked um, in a manner of speaking. <laughs> so, you know, if I had stayed, there was a next stage of work that needed to be done. And I was not about to start that next stage of work that needed to be done and leave it in an upheaval. I wasn't going to let a new person have to manage what I was in the middle of doing or undoing. So um, as, as the succession occurred, I tried to do exactly what my uh, uh, predecessor had done. I went away. I mean, I fielded phone calls from anxious stakeholders, from anxious employees, and in all cases, I reminded them how important they were to the organization and how critical it was that they support that new leadership. And a, a couple employees whom I love and respect a lot couldn't get over my leaving. And I said to them, you're gonna have to get along with your new boss or you're gonna have to leave. So there's an important, uh, there's an important point about being honest with everyone without having to, you know, you could bathe in that, oh, this, everyone's going to die without, the world's going to end if I'm not in this place at this time. Well, it, that's not the case. So you need to, you need to help everyone uh, get beyond that. So my, I didn't want to take work 
right there in Montgomery County where I was because I didn't want to poach the donors. I didn't want to poach the people that might care more about me than the organization. So I took a job that was an hour away and it took me away from my everyday network. Now, you know, on second thought, I should have taken my donors with me, but, you know, that's a decision that you, you question all the time. Um, so at any rate, I came to this new position when this organization was in a crisis. Um, they had uh, had to make a decision to remove the executive director. They had put an interim in place. And um, after my first interview, I mean, it was work that is just wonderful work the advocacy piece, which I've always had my deepest interest in. But after my first interview, I asked for the financials, and I did all of my due diligence. And when I saw those financials, my instinct was, yikes. I, um, I was so impressed by the fact that the board was doing the work they needed to do because they thought the work was too important to fail. They thought the mission of the organization, if, it, if this organization failed, it would have to be reinvented to do the same important work. So the day that I started as the executive director here, we had enough cash to make one payroll, we had a fully tapped out line of credit, we had no reserves, and we had $200,000 in debt. So I figured, you know, there is an advantage to having been in this world as long as I've been. There are things I can do. There are things that um, you know that if you can't do it, it probably can't get done right. Uh, so I was willing to take this job on. In truth, this job should have gone to a 40-year-old um, who has been living to become this advocate leader. But this financial side of this transition would have killed someone without the obtain years of experience I have in trying to work with funders. So um, in truth, the transition was a little bit challenging because number one, the board continued to be open and literally grateful that I had taken the job, but they were willing to come with me to funders to say, this is who we've hired, we believe this is the person, and we need you to get behind us again. So that was, that was um, um, it was sort of like uh, breathing again. It was like building something new, gaining the heart and energy of people again. Uh, so here I am now, four years later, and we're about to embark on a strategic plan, and at the conclusion of that three-year strategic plan will be a transition because I think I'm giving myself permission at, I'll be 68 in three years, I think I'm giving myself permission uh, to transition into at least a semi-retirement. So that's my story um, with only about 45 years in between. Um, I'm happy to answer questions when we get to that point. Becky, that was, uh, it was worth gold. I think I hear so often people saying, well, research uh, your next position so that you know exactly what you're walking into. You never exactly know what you're walking into. You can do a good job, but sometimes uh, that position is the, is the right position for somebody, um, even if it looks like a god-awful mess. Um, so uh, some of the most challenging um, work I've ever done has been in organizations that looked like they were about to give up the ghost. So. Um, so, Tom, I want to I want to pass it back over to you to talk real quickly, and we have probably at this point about 15 minutes to talk about what's the difference um, between um, executive transitions and success succession planning in terms of the timing, because the timing really is the important variable there. So, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Okay. Thank you, Ruth. Next slide. So we want to talk about imminent transition again. This means, uh, generally speaking, a transition is going to happen in a year or less. Could be happening next week. It could be happening within the next year. Uh, so the, one of the most challenging things to get clear about is the communication strategy. And that comes a lot out of the culture of the organization and the personality of the executive and the board. 
it's important when you think about communicating to think about your audiences and to think about how do you convey confidence that this organization is going to successfully manage this transition. So having information leak out uh, informally uh, doesn't usually work well. It, uh, the organization is better served to have a confidential period where you're just talking to a, a small group of your leaders that kind of in a trusted way. And then there's a, a, a fairly tightly confined public rollout of the message. Obviously, funders and stakeholders who, don't, who you don't want to hear about it secondhand need to be uh, talked with first. And so I've seen organizations have a, a week period of time where they're doing key funder outreach and calls, where they're meeting with staff, meeting with board, and then announcing the transition more publicly. So thinking through your communication strategy is really important if, if the transition is imminent. Paying attention to the good ending is about how to really honor and celebrate the executive who's leaving, uh, assuming that the organization is in that kind of position. Sometimes there are strained endings. And even when there are strained endings, it's in everyone's interest to have a good ending. You don't want to, to damage the reputation of the executive, either intentionally or unintentionally. And you don't want to damage the reputation of the organization. So really thinking about that, how are we going to get, what would a good ending look like given these circumstances and this transition? Sometimes that has to do with what kind of farewell event. Sometimes it has to do with things the current executive is handing off. Sometimes it has to do with changes in how leadership team meetings and the culture takes place. The variety of things that make for a good ending. Sometimes if the executive has been undercompensated for a long time, it really is a discussion about retirement and compensation. The variety of things that, but William Bridges, is a leading writer on transition, says to have a good beginning, you have to have a good ending. The third thing to pay attention to is, are we really ready to search for a successor? Sometimes, and we've experienced this, where boards set out thinking they're ready to go, and they really can't attract the quality of candidates that's, that's needed for the position. The group that uh, advocacy that, that Becky went with was really blessed that she was willing to take that on. Uh, without that, they would have needed a much more longer interim period to really turn that organization around so you could really get to the place where you could hire. The, the several reasons why organizations hire interim executives. Uh, one is around the condition of the organization not being ready for search. And so the, an interim is hired who has the strengths that are needed, whether that's fundraising, financial management, governance, and board building. Whatever needs to happen, uh, we need to go back to the past slide. The, whatever needs to happen to improve the organization needs to be attended to by the interim. The, other conditions where interims are brought in, if you think about Protestant churches and why they bring in interim pastors, it's because the congregation really isn't ready to work emotionally with a new pastor. So sometimes interim executives are brought in for that purpose. The transition is also a great opportunity to think about how are we doing in terms of diversity and inclusiveness. I've been working in the nonprofit sector since the 1970s. I've been in thousands of meetings about what we need to do to make the leadership of the sector more diverse. We are in some areas making progress and others we're not. But every time there's a hire, there's an opportunity for a board to take stock of its own approach to diversity inclusiveness. Not to make some kind of knee-jerk quick fix, but to really think deeply about what does diversity inclusiveness mean for us and how can we use this transition and search to advance that, whether that's how we constitute the transition and search committee, whether that's how we go about doing outreach to ensure we have a diverse pool, defining diversity for our context. Uh, but thinking intentionally about that, that's the only way the change occurs. Internal candidates are a really important part of successful transition. I did a, a transition with a community-based funding organization one time it ended up with two staff people applying, two people from the board, and three people who lived in the neighborhood community that they served. And they decided uh, not to interview any of them. And it became a major mess 
uh, because they basically said there's nobody in this community good enough to serve this organization. And so thinking about internal candidates, if they're on the staff, making sure that there's a real thoughtful process with the board about how that internal candidate is going to be considered and they're not being uh, crowned by the outgoing executive, that really it's the board's decision, and that there's real thoughtfulness to how internal candidates are handled, whether they're from the board, the staff, or from the community. The, in terms of help, uh, I think some of the hardest words in the world to say are, I need help. Uh, most of us grew up with strong doses of self-reliance, and that's what allows us to take on difficult challenges and be successful. Uh, at the same time, most of us have not been through a transition before. And so how do we get the help we need? As an executive, getting clear how and when you want to leave. When executives are conflicted and sending mixed messages, it undermines the process and weakens the relationship with the board over time. So getting an executive coach or a mentor or a friend to really help you think through what do you really want? Uh, do you want to stay there? Do you not? Is it, have you been there too long? Have you, is it time for a change? And then similarly with the organization, to really find the kind of transition help to help the board really manage this process successfully. Attention to that allows you to, to really get to the good ending. And finally, to have energy left for the onboarding process. Let's go to the next slide for a minute. So this three-phase process I mentioned before, in the prepare phase, we're really making sure the executive is ready and the organization is ready. We've identified the transition issues. We know what the 12 to 18 month priorities are. We know what's the strategic direction and therefore what competency we need and we have that written down so we can communicate it to candidates. We then do the search, uh, which is again proactively looking for that exceptional executive who fits the current and future leadership needs. We onboard that person really successfully by thinking about uh, what kind of orientation to the culture and to the community is needed, what kind of uh, six month, nine, 90 day and six month review is gonna be done, how do we ensure this is gonna be a positive uh, forward looking relationship? Next slide. So this is just detail uh, that we'll send to you afterwards. It gives you a little bit of more uh, sense of the, that three phase process. Next slide. So I've had executive directors say to me that when they're going through transition, they find like they have a, all of a sudden they have a new job. They have their regular day job and then they have this transition job. There's, it takes a lot of emotional energy to go through transition. And so the focusing on what does a good ending look like, both for you and for the staff and board, and how do you get between over this area that William Bridges calls the neutral zone or the in-between period? where there's confusion and anxiety, and also the opportunity for creativity. This is why transition is, we call them pivotal moments. If we successfully manage the ending in this neutral zone, we can really get to a new beginning that strengthens the organization and really helps increase the, the uh, sense of, of mission accomplishment. Next slide. So that's all about short term. Uh, then if your transition's not so imminent, the really the promising practices that offer the most are really to use this new approach to sustainability planning that really looks at this 100,000 foot overview of how are we doing as an organization. We've done this over the last three or four years since the recession with a number of organizations led by founders, long-term executives, uh, new executives, and each time we do it, the board and the executives and the, the management team very quickly get to what are their key issues. When you look at strategy and business model, look at culture, look at resources, look at the leadership of the organization, you can then create an action plan that says, okay, what's the highest and best use of whatever years of leadership we have together? So I'm gonna be there five more years, what's the highest and best use of that time? And so by doing this sustainability review, you're able to look at that, to, do, to look at the program mix, look at where the revenue's coming from. There's a lot been said about how we went a little too far on the diversify revenue, and it's really about going deeper around revenue. How do we link revenue and strategy and mission in a way that sets us up for the future and isn't living on yesterday's fumes? So the sustainability review looks at that part of it. And then the succession planning takes sustainability and puts it in the 
leadership continuity connection. So one of the weaknesses of strategic planning historically has been that we only looked at strategy. We didn't look at leadership and implementation execution. So when you combine sustainability and succession, and particularly your leader development and bench strength review, you can really think holistically about how to prepare both at the leadership level and at the strategy and, and systems level for long-term success. You can only imagine that that makes it more likely that your successor will uh, succeed. So these are ongoing practices. They don't need to be done every year, but they're practices, they're mindsets that we're paying attention to sustainability and succession. And one of the important things to, to make this mindset happen is to engage the board, and this is not about me as executive or the, the board chair leadership, it's about our system, about our whole leadership system and about how we work together in broadening the discussion. So if you're a, an executive who's thinking about leaving, you know, what's the gift you can give your successor? You know, there are things that you can get done right now that will take your successor months or years to do, whether they're personnel issues, finance issues, board relation issues. You know what are the things that are challenging, and do you really want to leave that behind for your successor? Similarly, we ask the board, times of transitions are times to step up. And if you see transition on your horizon, then what, do you really understand the organization? I mean, the staff's worst fear is that you don't get it, that the board doesn't understand the organization and you're going to hire somebody who doesn't fit. And so it's time for the board to step up and make sure you do get it. The sustainability review gives you that sense of what are our lines of business? What is our culture? How do we, what's sacred? What is it we want to really hold valued and sacred in this organization and preserve? If you've had those conversations, it's harder to mess up a transition. The final slide, please. So again, this is just a summary of the, if you have more time, the benefit of connecting sustainability and succession together and not thinking of it as a one-off, but really a process, an ongoing process of building leadership and building a sustainable, humming organization. And obviously, if you do that, you'd reduce your risk of unplanned absences, you strengthen your overall mission effectiveness, and you really engage in a process that where the board and staff and everybody's aligned. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, we have some really interesting questions um, that I want to get to, but I do want to say, I think that uh, that um, one of the issues that um, that Becky brought up was very interesting. The issue of making sure that as you're leaving, you do some kind of a transition so that people, um, if they did love you, if they did have loyalty to you, have a chance to transfer their transfer their loyalty and that you help them do that. Um, and I'm actually reminded of a of a transition that I made very early. Not so early. It was my it was my second executive directorship, but I had actually been uh, on the on the volunteer staff of this organization for quite a while, and ended up um, taking on the executive director position after I helped do a save of the organization financially. But um, when I got in there, like you, I found that um, that in fact some records had been falsified. <laughs> And so I had to basically deal with that without without um, ruining the reputation of the organization and not doing a whole, you know, blame I'm the good one, she was the bad one um, kind of dynamic. So to try to finesse that. But as I left, and this is the important part of um, what I'm trying to say, um, I actually left town, came back to Boston. I had been in Kansas, and I got a call from the woman who who um, replaced me, who had come externally to the organization. The organization had a very, very big volunteer staff. Um, and she said, I, I can't stay. Um, she said, I feel like I've replaced a dead child. <laughs> and I, I, you know, to me, I hadn't... It, it hadn't occurred to me that there was that kind of an emotional wrench 
to um, to that transition. I was still at that point fairly young, um, and I really did not understand what my responsibility was in helping to make that um, that switch. Um, so I think that that point is very important, Becky, and I, I hope that people really listen to that, that, that it, it actually is a big switch. And even if you're um, a, a, a truly hated executive, <laughs> there is something that needs to be done because God forbid that, you, um, that the board react and look for the exact opposite of you. Um, because that is a, an often made mistake for boards, that they will look at the last executive director, look at all of their faults and decide we need someone exactly the opposite without understanding where their strengths laid um, in, that, in that tenure. So I want to go on to some of the questions which are really interesting. Um, one of them is um, that, let me get this exactly right. How does an interim director best engage with a board that are contemporaries, in some cases, longtime friends of the departing executive director? So um, who would like to take a shot at that? Be happy to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to do it if I had an answer. You know, that's a tough question. Uh, <laughs> I think it's about the clarity of contract from the beginning. Uh, you know, I, some of the hardest transitions I've been involved in is where I had personal relationships with with a client, basically. Uh, and so, I, I guess the question is: Is this organization ready to have? Uh, to step up and have an, an identity beyond that founder, beyond, beyond that, uh, that where those relationship loyalties are, and for the loyalty to be to the to the mission and to the work, and to really test that, you know, if, if indeed there's a dysfunctional pattern of of groups of board members aligning around relationships, then that's a board development issue and something to be addressed. But it's really trying to raise the issue up to the to what end of the organization and how do we, why are we here? Because one of the questions when transition occurs is, do we still want to be here? Uh, or is our loyalty to the mission and to the work or to that person? And then if we're going to be here, then how are we going to work together? I would just add to that, this is a time for those real honest conversations. For example, the. The transition, when I left uh, Interfaith Works, the transition was the person that I recommended to the executive committee to step in was on staff, but I had talked with her several times and said to her, are you the least bit interested in being a candidate? Because the job that needs to be done by the interim is rarely the job that, I mean, I think that person should remove themselves from being a candidate. And that kind of is very clarifying. The board knows, well, I love Mary, but uh, she's going to do the interim, so we know that she can't be a candidate. So it's just making sure those conference, those facts aren't just assumed. They have to be said out loud to each other. And I want to recommend for people, um, because there are situations in which the founder um, does remain associated with the organization after they leave as executive director. Um, and those can be, they can be well managed or badly managed. Um, we, we actually have in the readings a, um, a piece by MAG, Management Assistance Group, about, uh, called A Table Set for Two. Um, that that addresses the uh, the question of how do you manage a situation where the where the former executive or the founder uh, stays involved with the organization and they have some very good and interesting research um, that can guide you in that. Um, 
This is a, a good one. Of course, we've all seen these situations. What's your experience and recommendation about board members becoming the new ED or departing ED joining the board? I asked, I asked to verify for my sister board members. I have very strong opinions about this issue myself. This is from the person asking the question. So uh, uh, the second part of that is really easy. Uh, departing executives just don't need to be on boards. It's not helpful to the income. It's very hard for the person following you to be empowered if you're sitting at the board. You don't have to say a word. Just your body language <laughs> communicates. Uh, it's just not a good thing for anybody. Uh, so I would, I would strongly recommend against being on the board. You know, if you're passionate about the issue, go away for three or four years and then ask yourself that question. But uh, certainly in the short run, it's not helpful to anybody. The board members becoming candidates uh, is a more complex question. It's really situational. You know, it's, it's how and why. It, it, is there a really a, a thoughtful plan, uh, defining of the job, and then a recruiting process, an interviewing and selection process? And if a board member appropriately decides to enter into that process, then that's fine. They just need to come off the board and appropriately engage as a candidate. They can't be both. They can't be a board member and a candidate. Uh, but the important thing, whether it's an internal candidate or a board member, sometimes we skip the step of asking ourselves, how is this job going to be different this time? What, where are we headed in the future, not where we've been in the past? And really redefine the job. Oftentimes, people decide they're candidates before they even know what the job is. So let the board do its work and define the job and then engage and see, you know, if this board member is an appropriate candidate, then make sure they're, they're handled as part of a process. It is very, uh, go, go ahead, Becky. I was just gonna say, I also think from the boardroom or the conference room, the job of, of executive director just looks like the most awesome, fun, exciting, important thing you could do. It's, such hard work, and most of it is not fun, awesome, glorious, and exciting. It's just that's the road to getting there. So the board members often, I believe, have a misperception about the day-to-day -day of the work of the executive director. Um, yeah, I, want to, I want to agree that I just think that it's absolutely critical that if a board member wants to be considered for the executive director, they step off the board. Um, they, not that they recuse themselves from those conversations, but they in completely step off the board. They should be that committed to being a candidate for the job. Um, I think it's way too confusing for people otherwise, and it breaks apart relationships. And, and you know, it, it threatens to split the board at a very tender time. Not, not, a, good, not a good idea. Um, I, I think, you know, on the other hand, um, could a board member make a good executive director? Absolutely. You know, there are if they've been sitting on the board for a while, they've shown their, um, you know, they've kind of shown their chops in terms of their commitment. Yes, they could very likely make a good board member if they have some of the other capacities. You just don't want that influence in the mix. Um, another question: I'm looking forward to a transition in the coming year. Do you recommend having someone hired to work with the C? CEO for six months or longer before they leave, or just hire them and work for a month before the CEO leaves? <laughs> or hire them and work for a, a week. Uh, so we, I've had a lot of these conversations over the years, and the, uh, the board and the outgoing executive always think the overlap period should be longer than the incoming person. And so I, I, I like to separate the availability or the access to the outgoing executive from the overlap period. Uh, I've, you know, sometimes it makes sense. It depends on if you have a very heavily relationship-oriented job and there's a, a case to be made that some relationship handoff work might be done in a week or two of work together, uh, that might make sense. Most times the cleanest thing to do is to have a definite end date. You leave, the new person starts, and the uh, you may be on a small consulting contract for uh, two, a month or two months where that person can ask you to do specific things that are helpful to, to her or him. Uh, there can be a short overlap period, 
but anything over a couple of weeks or a month is really excessive unless there's extraordinary uh, circumstances. The only exception to that is if there's internal succession uh, and there's a good working relationship between the outgoing and incoming and there's a reason, some a body of work. But again, the roles get confused very quickly. Staff doesn't know who's in charge and it just complicates things and, and it doesn't allow for the full empowerment. So even if there is that kind of thing, I think it's more of a, in a background consulting relationship than an upfront being in the office kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, so in terms of um, talking through with an executive about how to, um, you know, what they're leaving in terms of a legacy, um, we've gotten a couple of questions about the idea of executive director legacy. What are your thoughts on this? So, well, I thought unless it's unless the purpose of the legacy is to raise money for the organization, I think that you know, thank you should be enough. <laughs> Tom, uh, yeah, I think the word legacy means different things to different people, and so for some people, it's the same as sustainability. You know, that they have a uh, an investment there, and how is it going to be handed on? Some people want to be appreciated. And so culturally, you know, what is the ending? What does a good ending mean to you as an executive? Some people abhor public events and, and mm -hmm. celebrations. I've had executives cry when you say, we're gonna have an event for you. Right. Uh, but they're doing it not for themselves, they're doing it for the organization, for what right, Ruth right. just talked about. It's about saying goodbye. It's about a, a trend, uh, you know, an emotional handing off process. And so, separating out the emotional content of legacy and the emotional handoffs from the practical part, you know, does somebody need to have a building named after them or have a, uh, you know, some boards feel like if somebody's given 35 years of their life, they want to say thank you in some, some way that has a legacy component to it. That's really, uh, I think, situational to the culture of the people. So um, we're coming to the very end of this, and we obviously have a lot more to talk about, which is why we have five, uh, four of these webinars scheduled. But I do uh, want to just pick up on that. I actually did not go to my goodbye party when I was in Kansas. <laughs> that was, I, I, I just couldn't bring myself to say goodbye to people, and I think I think it does say something about about the um, the need to really discipline yourself to responsibly hand over an organization. But the, the next um, webinar is going to be specifically on the issue of the kind of crossover between the emotional and professional responsibilities of leaving an organization. Um, how do you make the decision? How do you communicate the decision? How far ahead of, um, of, a, of a leaving do you want to communicate that? Um, what are the things that you want to consider? All of that. We're, the next webinar is going to be called uh, CEO Confidential. Um, it will be a place where you can really ask the questions you need to ask about your own particular situation, but we'll also talk more generally about how, um, you know, how people have handled situations in which they've gotten into a kind of a knot of, um, of considerations. Um, about leaving, which we all do, um, unless you're a superhero. So I want to thank um, Becky very much and Tom for your participation in this. Everybody who's here should know we're going to send you a, um, a list of resources that we may have talked about, but or, or specifically, or um, that we've you know referred to content. Um, that, that, you know, we've referred to in terms of content. You'll all get that by email. Um, we also have um, on our next slide, we have a list of the websites that you can go to, Board Source, RAFA, and NPQ. We all have content on those websites that you can access. In the meantime, let us know how this went for you, and we will try, anybody who, who logged in a question that we didn't answer, we'll try to take it up in the next 
couple of webinars. And thank you very much. Come back soon. Thank you, guys.